Father, we thank you for you. We thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for how you're moving in our midst. We thank you for you being God. Lord, as we are about to approach Scripture, we pray that you would just teach us. Teach us by way of your Holy Spirit. We want to receive from you. We want to hear from you. We want to grow from you. We want to learn from you. Most importantly, Lord, we want to be the people that you would have us to be. So thank you for being God in our midst. Now open our hearts to hear, open our hearts to receive, open our hearts to be in tune, and let us grow, God, to produce the fruit that you're looking for. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen. Come on, say amen if you're here. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Bernard. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Amen. Brief message. I have a brief message. Uh, I was joking with first service and saying to them that if this were foot, football season, you'd appreciate it, especially if Dallas were playing, playing um, the Broncos. Um, yeah, which, whatever. Amen. All y'all need Jesus. Amen. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wait till it happens. Amen. It's going to be like the rapture. Um, <laughs> no, it's going <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. But I just, I'm not going to be before you long. Um, nothing real heavy, nothing real deep to share. Um, just a, two simple parables that are in front of us this morning that as we've been going through the book of Matthew, especially, specifically chapter 13, we are upon uh, this brief parable. And I want to take a moment just to explain. And I hope that you would take something out of it to be who God would have you to be. So let me begin like this. Um, if I were Jewish and if I were part of the nation of Israel and I am in existence probably in the book of Genesis at the beginning of time when God called Abraham to leave his home and go to a place that he's going to show him and then God changed the name of Abraham's descendant to Israel and then he gives birth to the nation of Israel. And then I know that I'm called to be a called out people of God. And then God's going to use me for his purpose and glory. I have expectation from Jesus when he shows up on the earth realm. In that, um, if I have to go through what I have to go through, I would assume that there's a purpose behind it. And at the end, God's going to turn that thing around. Let me tell you what I mean by that. The Israelites were given birth to, they went through their sojourn. Uh, God used this guy by the name of Joseph to allow them to be preserved uh, in the land of Egypt where the famine came and the famine took over the earth for these seven years. You, you knew that story quite well. But at the end of that, the text picks up by saying in the book of Exodus, there arose a new king on the scene who didn't know who Joseph was. And because of his ignorance of Joseph's history and how Joseph really blessed the Egyptians, he subjected the people of God to cruel and unnecessary punishment. By that, he had them placed in forced labor where they were making bricks out of straw, all because he was afraid that they would rise up and partner with probably an uh, enemy nation and overthrow the Egyptian government or Egyptian empire, who at the time had established world dominance. But if I had to go through that, and then not only that, but God raises up Moses, and Moses delivers the Israelites from Egypt out of bondage, take them on this 40-year journey to this promised land where Joshua led them in. They're in the land, and then the book of Judges happens. They obey God. They disobey God. God raises up a judge to deliver them. Then they go in the place of captivity, they keep disobeying God. Then God allows the Babylonian Empire and all the Assyrians and all these pagan nations to in cap to put them in captivity. And they ended up split northern, southern kingdom. They found themselves in a bad place. So I'm saying that to say the plight of the Israelites have always been a people that were submitted to less than. Then the New Testament happens, and then there's this promise that the Messiah is about to enter the scene. Now, if I'm them, and I know that I've been subjected to punishment for so long, when the Messiah comes, my expectation that it's my turn to rise to world prominence. It's my turn to, to, to step up to a place of, of where we are now the world power. So what this looked like is when Jesus came on the scene in the book of Matthew, 
the hope of every Israelite, the hope of every Jew, was this was going to be the time when the kingdom of God was going to be established in the earth realm. The problem with that is that the kingdom of God didn't look like anything that they expected the kingdom of God to be like. Come on, is this making sense? And, 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 and don't be so hard on, on the Jews because the advantage that you and I have is we have the whole story. And because we have the whole story, we know how the story ends, and we know that there had been a shift and that the kingdom was already here, but they couldn't see it. But if you are walking through that, and you've been down your entire life, and then the Messiah comes on the scene, your expectation is, just like the Jews were, that it's your turn, it's time to flip the script and be in a position of power. But that's not what it was like. Jesus found himself being with them, and they still not recognizing who he was or not even knowing that the kingdom was already here, even though it didn't look like what they expected it would look like. Now, I'm going to say this. My problem in following Christ is I have certain expectations, and when it doesn't look the way I think it ought to look, I have a problem with God. Come on, am I by myself? Can we be honest this morning? We all go through that. We have expectations of what, it would, should, what, what things should look like as it relates to this walk with God. So Jesus finds himself in the New Testament having to explain over and over again the kingdom of God is not what you think it ought to be, but the kingdom of God is like. And then he would use a parable, he would use a metaphor, he would use a simile, he would use some figure of speech to amplify what the kingdom of God is like to help these people understand what the kingdom of God is. So in chapter 13, we've been here for about three weeks now, he uses another parable to help them to understand what the kingdom of God is like. Except in this parable, he uses two simple similes to help amplify the point of the kingdom of God. So go with me to Matthew chapter 13 and jump down to verse 31. I'm going to read, and I want to explain and talk through this. Like I said, I'm not going to be real long with you this morning. I just want you to get the principles and the concept of what this is talking about. If you're in chapter 13, say amen. amen. If you are at verse 31, say amen again. Amen. Good. Now let me read. Let me read. Now I'll be reading from the, the English Standard Version. And it reads as such. And he put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. Verse 32 says, It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Verse 33 said, he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour, and he says, till it is all leavened. Now, if I'm in the audience, I am a hearer of this parable. I am still saying to Jesus, what in the world? Mustard seed? Leaven? The kingdom of heaven is like? What's that supposed to mean to me? So come on, say mustard seed. So I want us to look, I want us to look, because he uses these agricultural metaphors to talk to the Israelites to help them to understand what the kingdom of God is like. So I want us to look at the mustard seed and its growth pattern so we can hear what it's saying. And I'll just explain, and then we're going to move along. Won't be before you long at all this morning. So notice how he opens up by saying, he put another parable before them in verse 31. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sown in his field. 32. It is the smallest of all seeds. It is the smallest of all seeds. It is the smallest of all seeds. Here's the first thing I want you to know about the mustard seed that Jesus is trying to communicate. Number one, the mustard seed, and here's the term that I use, is the smallest seed known at the time to Jesus' listeners. Now, we can probably prove agriculturally today that there are seeds that are smaller than the grain of mustard seed, but at the time when Jesus was speaking, it was the smallest seed that the people could identify with. And here's the thing that Jesus really wants to communicate, where these Israelites, 
expected that when Jesus entered the earth realm, he would come riding on a white horse. He would come with an army. He would come overthrowing the Roman Empire. He would come with the blast of trumpet. He would come as the strong, powerful, dominant thing. Here is what he says. I came, and it may seem to the majority of the world as an insignificant thing that entered the earth realm. Okay? So the kingdom begins small, and, and, and what's striking about that mustard seed, it is a small thing that's very visible, that's really hard to see. And, and I want to go here and begin here by saying that it's because things aren't big and, and magnanimous and, and, and loud sounding and all that stuff doesn't mean that it can't have impact. Come on, somebody say amen in here. So, so he, he didn't come looking the way the world thought he ought to look. He came quiet. He came humble. And he came in what the majority world will call insignificant. Matter of fact, I believe it was one prophet says, can any good thing are you with me? Come out of Galilee, right? Simple, insignificant. It starts small, and it's the smallest thing they ever knew, but oh, the impact that that small thing can have. So here's how, here's how it continues secondly, right? The mustard seed, it's, even though it's small, it's the fastest and it's the largest growing garden shrub. Small, Fastest growing, largest growing garden shrub. Read with me. Read with me, then I'll talk about this. Notice what he says. Um, verse 32, it is the smallest of all weeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all garden plants and becomes a tree. Now, the reason I want to spend a moment to elaborate on the word garden shrubs, because some of your translations might use the word tree, and you might mistakenly believe that, that, that this um, mustard seed grows into this humongous tree, but it really is a garden plant. It really is a shrub that starts small, and if you're not careful, as the thing continues to grow, it can be the dominant thing in your garden. Now, I'm saying that for a reason, because I want y'all to catch it. Look at the picture behind me. That picture is an image of a man that is standing behind what one mustard seed could produce. Okay? It's not a tree. It's a shrub. You kind of get what I'm saying? But it grows and it has such impact, it has such influence, it has such presence that you can mistake the thing for a tree because of how it spreads. Now, what I like about that, because let me go here briefly, and then we're going to walk through this, is that, is that what starts small doesn't necessarily stay small, but in time, that thing grows, and it has impact, and it can potentially take over a particular area. Now, don't miss the message that Jesus is communicating to his listeners. The kingdom starts small. It grows fast, and it grows big. The kingdom starts small. It grows fast. Come on, are you hearing me? And it grows big, yeah. The kingdom starts small. It grows fast, and it does what? It grows big. I want y'all to hear me. I'm saying it one more time so somebody can get it. The kingdom starts small, and it grows what? Fast, and it grows how? Because God's intent is that he has a way of subtly entering into situations that you might not even know he's there. And the problem with me and the problem with you is because we can't see him all the time and because we can't feel him and because we can't put our hands on him, we fool ourselves into thinking he's not there. But oh, he's there. Small grows fast, and it grows what? Big. Come on, say it. Starts small, it grows fast, and it grows what? Big. Now, now let, me, let, me, let me show you this, this third thing, and then we're going to talk through this. So now notice this. When fully grown, the mustard seed, okay, it provides refuge to all who seek it. Now, let me read, let me read, let me read. Notice what it says, and then we'll talk about this, and I'm almost there. It says here, when it is fully grown, I'm in verse 32, it is larger than all the garden plants, and it becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make their nests in its branches. 
Here's the subtle nuance that Jesus is communicating. If you were here a few weeks ago, when we began this series, we talked about the kingdom of God is like a man who goes forth and sows seed. And you remember me say this, some fell on the path, and then the birds of the air came and did what? Picked it up and ate it. Now, here's what you heard about that. About it. The birds at that particular point in, in the narrative symbolize the evil one who would come and snatch away the seed that was shown, sown in the ground. Here's what Jesus is communicating this time. This thing that starts small, that grows fast, that becomes large, it gets to the place where, um, and, and this is what the Jewish people were hearing him say, that evil people in time is so influenced by the kingdom that they come and they can find refuge in it. Let me explain, let me explain. If I'm a Jew and my entire history has been slavery, bondage, captivity, I am going through all this so the Messiah can come through my lineage, my expectation is I'm going to get even with the people who subjected me to slavery, to bondage, to captivity, to all that stuff. Wait till the Messiah come and we set up kingdom. We're going to have world power. But here's what Jesus is saying. The kingdom is not like that. When the kingdom is established, the very people who enslaved you, the very people who 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 put you in bondage, the very people who had you in captivity, the kingdom is not only for you, but it's also for them. This is good, this is good, this is good, this is good, because a lot of us have fooled ourselves into thinking that salvation is only extended to a select group of people, but last I checked, the Bible still says, whosoever will... Come on, let him come. I want y'all to hear me say this. And what I like about that is that the kingdom, when it grows fast and it grows big and it grows tall, it's going to attract, attract people that don't look like me, people that don't smell like me, people that don't dress like me, people that don't behave like me, people that don't speak the same way I speak. Come on. It's for everybody. So that's why he said in one, in one position, one parable, he says, Master, we've invited everybody to come and there's room. He says, go into the highways and the hedges and the byways and compel them to come that my house may be full. Amen. I like this. Amen. I like this. Because you wonder why the scribes didn't like him? Here's what they said. You can't possibly be Messiah because Messiah wouldn't talk like that. They had a faulty perception of what the kingdom is. And Jesus is trying to correct it. Let, let us be careful ourselves that we don't have a faulty perception. And because here's what I'm going to, I, I want to say to you. We're going to find people having access to the kingdom that we think don't deserve it. Come on, be careful with that. Be careful with that. Lock into what I'm saying. When fully grown, the mustard seed provides refuge. And watch the phrase, to whoever seeks it. What I like about that, it doesn't matter what you did last night. If you need refuge, the kingdom is for you. Come on, I want y'all to hear me this morning. Come on. It doesn't matter where you found yourself yesterday or even this morning. If you need refuge, the kingdom is for you. Are you hearing me this morning? It doesn't matter how bad your past may be. If you are looking for a place of refuge, the kingdom is for you. It starts small, it grows fast, and it grows large. And the reason it grows large is because whosoever will, let them come. So don't miss this. He's making a subtle point. Three things. It's a small beginning. A. Two. It grows fast and it grows large. And three, it's for whosoever will, let him come. Come on, say it starts small. It grows large. And it's for everyone. One more time. Say it starts small. It grows large. And it's for everyone. Let that rest. So in that same passage, he tells them another parable. Look at verse 33. And he says, in that one, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. Come on, say yeast. yeast. Everybody say, say yeast. yeast. It's like leaven that a woman took and hid 
in three measures of flowers till it was all leavened. Now, first service, um, I knew nobody except for a few seniors knew how to make bread. I'm pretty sure it's worse than this service. I'm pretty sure it's worse because I'm looking around the room and yeah, you guys are a bunch of young people. Yeah, I don't have a clue. What y'all know about baking bread is going to King Supers and buying it. That's what y'all know about baking, but you have no clue about the bread making process. Are you with me? I mean, y'all, y'all, no, don't fool yourself. Y'all don't. None of you know what it is to have dough between your fingers. Uh-uh, uh-uh. What, no, what, yeah, y'all, bread machine, that's it right there, whatever that is. Yeah, a bunch of spoiled whatevers. You know, uh, Martha Stewart wouldn't even like you all up in here. Yeah, you go buy this thing and pour the flour and pour the ingredients, pour this in it, and then plug the thing in and turn it on and walk away. Don't know nothing about making bread. Not the case, not the case, not the case in this scenario. These individuals knew quite well what the bread-making process was. So watch, watch how this unfolds, and I want you all to see this. So notice the thing. I want you all to see how this unfolds so we can talk through it. So here's what he says. Look at verse 33. He told him another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took, and my translation says, hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Now, here's the point. To make bread, you take the yeast, and it says it is hid or mixed in with the flour. Now, what's being communicated in this passage where it talks about that she took three measures of flour until it was all mixed in is that the equivalent of this lady taking a little bit of yeast and mixing it in with about 50 pounds of flour. And the, 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 it's, it's a hyperbole to talk about the impact that the yeast is having on the flour. First parable, small mustard seed grows fast, grows large. Second parable, little yeast grows fast, <laughs> large. Y'all get it? You kind of get what I'm saying? So he's communicating the same thing over and over. Let me, let me show y'all what yeast might look like for those that don't know. It's um, that white stuff in the bowl is flour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, y'all just know what cornmeal is because you, you fry your catfish in cornmeal. You know, y'all don't use flour. To, in, I, in Ireland, we, lo- we use flour to, you know, the real stuff. And, and the little spoon, the little spoon is the yeast. Now, here's the thing that she's putting the yeast in it and mixing it in. Now, here's the thing that you might not understand about, about the bread-making process is that in the culture, you would think that this process is repeated every single time. But here's what would happen. At the first time, when um, the bread maker or the homeowner or the woman would make um, flour uh, or yeast, I mean bread, is she would take the flour, mix in the yeast, knead the dough, and what kneading means is that she Okay? Yeah, yeah. See, you can't appreciate kneading because y'all got the machine. And the reason a lot of us can't grow is you won't let God knead us. You won't let God, come on, you come on, mix you up a little bit and rub you because it hurts when he does that. Are you with me? You can't appreciate that. But here's what would happen. Here's what happened. The homemaker would take the flour and put the yeast in it and mix it up. And then what she would do is she would pinch off a piece of the, the completed dough and, and put it aside for the next time that she's about to make bread right? And she would take the bread that she made and put it together, put it in the oven and create as many loaves as she wants. The second time, she won't start over with raw flour and yeast. She would just start off with raw flour. And here's the interesting part. She would grab the dough that she put aside. And remember mustard seed, small, insignificant. Don't fool yourself into thinking it's a whole lot of yeast. She'd take just a little bit of that, that same piece of dough, and just drop it in the flour. In the case of this parable, he's saying she took that little bit of dough and dropped it into about 50 pounds of flour. Then she got to kneading. And it was in the kneading that the thing eventually had impact on the entire bowl such that that little bit of yeast impacted that entire bowl of flour. Okay, now, 
Look at the word. Say it was hid in the flower. Say that. Say it was hid in the flower. I like that because, because the word that's used there, it's a word that we can translate mixed in. And the reason the translators say hid, and I use mixed in, it's the same word because once you put in there and you mix the thing in with the flour, over time you can't find the yeast in the flour. I wish I had somebody in here. Over time, as you mix the thing in there, you know it's there, but you just can't see it. Come on. But, 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 but how you know it's there is that you put that completed product on the shelf, and the only reason the bread starts to rise is because the yeast that's hidden in the flour. Come on, somebody talk to me. Talk to me this morning. And, and here's what Jesus is trying to get them to understand. The kingdom of God is like a gardener who went out and sowed seed. But he just got through talking about the previous parable about an enemy coming sowing bad seed. He's saying now, here's what God did. He took a bowl of flour and he dropped us in it. Then in time, look at what happens. It starts to grow. And then it starts to have impact. It starts to grow, and then it starts to have impact. It starts to grow, and then it starts to have impact. Such that, such that, such that, the result of being mixed in is the impact the yeast has on the entire batch. Lock into this. One little piece of yeast produces enough bread, commentator says, if you do the math on this, 50 pounds of flour to feed about 100 to 150 people. Y'all say, wow, make me feel good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, here's what that looked like. A little piece of yeast impacting a neighborhood of 100 to 150 people. Let me help y'all see what that looks like. One little piece of yeast dropped into Montbello impacting a whole neighborhood. One little piece of yeast dropped over in Green Valley Ranch. Starts to impact a whole, y'all not getting this. One piece of yeast dropped into Highlands Ranch and it starts to impact the whole. One piece of yeast dropped into Park Hill. One piece dropped into Parker. Wherever you live, wherever you live, one piece of yeast, he just takes it and he puts it right in the middle of Kaiser Permanente. One, one piece of yeast, he takes it and he puts it in children's hospital. One piece of yeast, he puts it in, y'all not getting this, y'all not getting this, in public service. Come on, credit union. One piece of yeast, one piece of yeast, wherever you work, he takes you as that one piece of yeast and he drops you off. And I like, I like, I like the fact that it's hidden and it's mixed in with. It don't have to walk around acting like it's holy. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Folk don't even know you're there, but you have an impact. Oh, come on, talk to me this morning. People don't even realize your presence is there, but you're having impact. And I thank God for that because who I am today is simply the result of God taking flour. When it says he took dust and he formed man and he took yeast and he breathed into man and man became a living soul. So when I got infected with yeast, the yeast permeated all the flour so that I am no longer flour, I am yeast. Problem, 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 problem with the church is we don't know that we are yeast and we fool ourselves into thinking we're flour. Flour by itself doesn't raise nothing. Come on. Matter of fact, they call flour without yeast unleavened bread. That's the flat stuff with no life in it. I wish I had somebody in here. And if you find yourself not having life in you, you might want to check to find out where the yeast is. Are you hearing me? And I want you to leave here today knowing that you're not flour, you're yeast, and God designed you to have impact and influence wherever he deposited you. Now, let me go here before I take my seat. Let me go here. Let me, don't fool yourself now into thinking that it takes a whole lot of yeast. No, 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 no. Here's the point. Mustard seed size yeast. 
That's the point. It starts small, it grows fast, and it has big impact. So don't fool yourself into thinking that you've got to memorize Genesis to Revelation before you start having impact. You just need to know the world Bible and the God of the Bible. That's all it takes for you to start having impact this morning. A relationship with God is all it takes to begin the process. Then as you grow fast and big, you'd be amazed at the impact that you're going to have. Amen. Here, 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 here. Let me say this and then I'm done. I want to share my big idea. God's kingdom, here's what I believe this text is saying. Though insignificant in its beginning, will continue to grow and impact the world by providing a place of refuge to everyone. Come on, say everyone. everyone. Say it again. Say everyone. everyone. Who seek it. So when you're going out and you take these 10 cards or wherever it is that God has you, don't pick and choose who you talk to. Oh, that one ain't ready. You don't know. Come on, listen to me, y'all. Come on, come on, come on, come on. The person who is acting up the most, the reason they're acting up is because they need some yeast in them to slow them down. And God might have positioned you, might have positioned you and I as the infectant to inject them with some yeast so they can come to a relationship with him. Don't lock into that. Now, here's the other thing I want y'all to take away from this text by way of a theological idea. God's intent for his kingdom is that it grow to infiltrate every aspect of Satan's kingdom by impacting as many people as possible, resulting in the salvation of enemy. Here's what the text is saying theologically. God deposits us in the world. Or John 3, 16, he placed his son in the world as he is. Whosoever will, let him come. It starts small, grows fast, and it grows big. Come on, is this making sense? Come on, say amen if you're getting this. Now, let me say this by way of vision for Restoration Christian Fellowship, and I want you all to hear me say this because this is important. People will look at Restoration Christian Fellowship and they say, we would seem as either medium to a large church depending on, relatively speaking, however you look at it. But the point is this. God has destined Restoration Christian Fellowship for major impact in the city of Aurora and the metro area of Denver, providing a place of refuge from the worries and cares of this world. How do you know that, preacher? And this is true for every church. By virtue of the fact that you are here, if one lump of leaven can impact or feed 100 to 150 people, imagine how much impact you and I can have if we do what God called us to do. Places of refuge grow to where birds can perch in its branch. Here's what God's saying to you individually. Regardless of how insignificant you may feel at the moment, God's design is for you to grow to the place where you are influencing your surroundings, and that's home, school, work, or play with his love, resulting in people being, uh, developing a love relationship with him. Excuse the being, and that's a typo. But God's goal is for you individually, regardless of how you feel right now. And here's what I say to people all the time, and I want you all to hear me say this, because here's the point. The devil's job is to not let you realize who you are. His job is to stop you from feeling like the influencer that God created you to be. He's to stop you from feeling like the leader that God created you to be. To stop you from feeling like the person that God created you to be. And he will make you feel like flower all day long. But if we know who we are and who God created us to be, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. No temptation of the enemy. I want you to know, we need to learn to encourage ourselves in the Lord. So hear me say that. God's goal is that we influence. And let me end with this. Here's what I want to say to every person in here, and I want you all to hear this this morning. Humble beginnings can produce great results. Like the mustard seed and yeast, as a child of God, you can achieve greatness in Christ. You can realize that dream that God has gave you. You can accomplish God's design and plan for his life, for your life. Let me say this, and I'll quote that scripture, and we'll be done. As a child of God, don't let nobody tell you what you can't do or be. Come on, I want y'all to hear me. I want you to hear me this morning. Don't let the enemy ever fool you into thinking that I messed up real bad so God can't use me. No such thing. 
This thing grows to the place where the birds of the air can come rest in its branch. If God can accept me, God can accept you. If God can accept the person, come on, I want you all to hear me say this this morning. Your past has no influence on your future when it comes to the things of God. He forgives, he cleanses from all unrighteousness, and he justifies us. And when he looks at you and when he looks at me, he does not see what we did yesterday. He sees his blood that covers our sins. And don't allow the enemy to ever make you feel less than. So what? You started that business yesterday. Try again. So what? You tried to go to school and didn't make it. Try again. So what? I want y'all to hear me. So what? Your marriage failed. Don't think you need to give up. Try again. God is a loving God. He created us for more. Matter of fact, like, like the, the Bible says in the book of First Corinthians, we need to learn to take those thought captives. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are right, whatsoever thing of a good report, think on those things. Learn to encourage ourselves in the Lord because the enemy will try to stop us from being who God would have us to be. Here's what Philippians 4 says. Paul puts it this way. I can do all things. And how he says it, not in my own flesh, not in myself, because of the yeast that's on the inside of me. Through Christ, who gives me strength. We are positioned in the earth to grow the kingdom of God, have an impact. So wherever we find ourselves, remember this. Mustard seed, leaven. Doesn't take much but it has impact. Here's what this looks like, and I'm done with the disciples in the New Testament. Insignificant businessmen, some of them just fishermen, nothing. God took these 12 guys, and they're going around thinking, I'm uneducated and I'm skilled. I don't know the word like that. I wasn't raised in the Old Testament in Hebrew. I know none of that stuff. Yet and still, at Pentecost, let me use a metaphor, when the yeast entered them, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. Here's what all the intellectual folks said. Aren't these men Galileans? Aren't these unlearned men? How is it we hear them speak our own language? Where did they get this knowledge from? Where did they get this power from? That's how God created you, and that's how God created me. Come on, say amen. I want you all to hear me say that. I want you to hear me say that. So he's not only using this parable to help motivate people to see the influence of the kingdom, but there's motivation in it to let us know we can be, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen. If you're here this morning and you've been feeling less than, I want to remind you with this parable. It doesn't take much, but God created you to have influence and impact. Bow your heads with me this morning as the worship team comes. Come on, put your hands together for God. As the worship team comes and share, and I want to pray with you this morning. Come on, stand to your feet this morning. Stand to your feet. We just want to stand and allow God to be God this morning so we can hear. I want to pray over you that Pastor Katani is going to come, and we want to take a moment that if there's one here that might be going through, I don't want you to leave here the same way you came in. God can do a great work in you. God can change you. God can use you for his purposes and for his glory. Allow him to be God in your midst. Allow him to be God. So bow your heads and search your hearts. And as you search your heart this morning, if there's stuff there that's been stopping you from being who God would have you to be, we want to give you a chance to just take that to the Lord and allow God to do a new work in your life. Holy Spirit, as your word has gone forth this morning. I thank you for you, God. I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for being God in our midst, Lord. I pray, God, that you would just move in this place, Lord. We are vessels of impact, influence. We're not flour, we're yeast. So speak, God, to a person that might be here that might not know you. That God, you would be God, Lord. So we bless you and we thank you for who you are and what you're doing. In your name we pray.